Well, a very good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Royal Court Theatre for the next of our Cunard Insights lectures. And the final a lecture by a gentleman talking about his experiences in Papua New Guinea before we hear from his wife in a few days' time. But today, talking about being on patrol, please give a very warm welcome to John Hucknall. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Kat. Yes, uh, for, for those of you who didn't come to any of my other presentations, I'm a former patrol officer in Papua New Guinea, and uh, now we get down to the real nitty-gritty of patrolling. This is on patrol. Um, just to recap, uh, patrol officers in Papua New Guinea are known as KIAPs, which is a derivation of the German word Kiaptin, and that's basically formed in, in New Guinea. The, um, uh, in Papua, the Papuan side, the southern side, they were known as patrol officers, but over time it amalgamated with Pigeon English spreading right throughout the country and we all became KIAPs. We've got uh, self-government was in 1973 and then eventually they had independence in 1975. But that's me on the left there, that's not a uniform. I had an uncle living in Singapore, he was with the Royal Air Force, and I said to him, I'm going to Papua New Guinea up into the tropics, what sort of clothes should I wear? So he dispatched three sets of shirts and shorts from Royal Air Force tropical wear, and I used those for the entire time that I was in Papua New Guinea. One off, one on, and one in the wash. Um, the Akubra hat was an army surplus store from Sydney. I, I picked up the army Akubra. But anyway, that's, that's what I used to wear, but we never wore a uniform as such. Um, but we were on patrol, and we would have anywhere between 20 and 100 carriers to carry our equipment, everything that we needed, tables, chairs, you name it, they carried it. And uh, this is a group of guys coming through. The patrol boxes were galvanized iron boxes with uh, a rubber seal in the lid so that when they shut that down, if they happened to drop it into a, a river or a lake, um, they would inevitably float and they were reasonably waterproof. But the culinary delights, you're all being spoiled on this ship. This is what I had to eat when I was on patrol. Ox and palm, I know there's, a, I know there's somebody up there that's laughing his socks off at <laughs> ox and palm. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, lunch and meat, but we also took along with us some tin fish and, and uh, rice. Generally, we had rice, but when we got into the villages, we, we bought vegetables and the like. But the typical sort of thing, no electricity when we were on, on patrol. We were living in, in grass huts, basically, and uh, we would have a Coleman lamp. So any of you that have been out camping and the like, you've probably used one of these Coleman lamps, and the the mantle that they had, a silk mantle that you, you attached to the lamp and you set fire to it and it became, gave off a brilliant light but was really, really fragile. So when we went on patrol, we had to take dozens of replacement mantles for these lamps because the, lamp, the, the mantle that was in the lamp, inevitably by the time we got to where we were going, was, was just dust. So we had to set off a new one. But um, I had a... Uh, I suppose you would call him a domestic servant, would, would go with me on patrol and he'd take care of the cooking and, and making sure the bed was made, etc., etc., whilst I was working. And all the cooking was done on a, a, a two-burner primer stove, which was quite interesting, um, especially when you ran out of kerosene. You, you, you had to be quite inventive. But one of the first things they did uh, when we arrived in the, in the village got into the house, that would come out, and on top of the stove they would put a, a large galvanised uh, bucket with sufficient water to put into a shower bucket. And these are canvas shower buckets with a top ros rosette top that you would turn just to allow the water out. So you would, you would get yourself wet, close it off, soap up, wash, wash, open, rinse, close, wash again, open. And you try and use five gallons of water, hot water, to uh, um, to take your shower with. If you were feeling a little bit on the 
adventurous side, you'd make sure that he had another bucket on the boil whilst you were having your, your first shower. But um, we've had uh, droughts in Brisbane and uh, the Lord Mayor was running around with little uh, egg timers to hand out to everybody. You got them with your daily newspaper with a, a three minute egg timer and that was the length of shower that you could have when Brisbane was uh, having a great, a great uh, lack of water. But on patrol itself, this is a, on the left hand image, this is a typical site of entering into the jungle from uh, the grasslands outside. Now, a lot of you will have seen uh, TV um, films about being in the jungle and they're slashing away with bush knives and cutting down. That's not the case. You can see the height of these trees here. There's very little growth on the, under, uh, the undergrowth of the, in the forest and where uh, the people would walk back and forth between the villages, there was always a fairly clear track. Um, and uh, so therefore this image of a, of a patrol officer or somebody slashing the bush and cutting their way through, it was, that wasn't the case. Very, very early days, yes, but um, that, that would have been in the 1930s that they would have been doing that. And then you come across these really beautiful images like this uh, waterfall here, and that's the sort of place that you would stop, strip off, have a quick shower under the icy cold water, dry off, get claws on and off you would go again. I would walk for anywhere, well, one walk that I did was 13 hours. I started at three o'clock in the morning with uh, a, a, two guys with me, with Coleman Lamp, one at the front, one at the back, and we actually ran from way, way up in the, the highlands down to the coast, and that was the last day of my 70-day patrol. I wanted to get home and see my wife, <laughs> so, so in the middle of the, well, three o'clock in the morning, we lit the Coleman lamps and uh, we ran through the jungle. It was quite, quite interesting doing that. I think we might have frightened a few villages when these two lights were just bouncing through the jungle in the middle of the night. But one of the things that we had to be very mindful of when we were going through was land boundaries. Now, as I said before, there are over 850 different um, languages and cultures in Papua New Guinea. And consequently, there was, there was land boundaries. So when we would move from one village to the next, we would go to the, the boundary and we would stop and wait for the carriers to come from the next village to come up and collect our gear to take back to their village. And um, we never ever paid the carriers that had brought us, say, from the coast up into the hills. Uh, we never paid them until we got the replacement carriers in. Otherwise, it was quite possible we could have been sitting there with me and a couple of policemen and a couple of other people there waiting and waiting forever. So this was a, this was a change of a situation. But um, we did patrols on rivers, on the sea, um, in the mountains. And uh, this is a sort of really picturesque view here of a tributary of the Aramu River. We were on patrol there just meandering through this lazy little lagoon and into this particular village here. So that's, that's how it looks. Now, I've got no idea how global warming is going to affect that place, but if you had a, a rise of a metre of water in, in that area there, that village would be gone. Um, but in this particular area, you would have to make sure you definitely watch out for crocodiles when you're in, in this area. But this is the type of river that we would move along and as you can see, twists and turns a bit. Right up in the top left hand corner, you see a couple of bits of, of what used to be the river, but that's what happens. Every now and then you'll get a big downpour and the river would cut across and join and you would end up with a little island and, and some water there. To walk from the bottom right corner to the top left might only take you maybe two or three hours. But to actually round, go around the, the river in a canoe, you're looking at maybe an hour and a half in a canoe. But um, one of the problems that we had, and everybody nowadays is, is so aware of workplace health and safety, 
these are a few of the problems that we encountered on work, work, our working life. Everything from the smallest, from leeches, right the way through to crocodiles. And uh, we had to be aware of, of both of those. So in particular, when we were crossing rivers, um, you had no idea what was in the water. So what I would do is send the dog in first. And he would toddle, he would swim across the river and we would all follow him. But that was, that's a quite a, a benign type of, of river there that we were going through, a, a large stream. But this is a, the Ramu River and you can see the banks of the, of the river on the left hand side there and canoes down the bottom. Now the river would actually flood quite regularly right up to the top bank through there and um, way over in the distance is the patrol officer's house. But in this particular area, we're, we're talking about maybe 300, 400 kilometers upstream from, from the sea, uh, the uh, of fish, um, sharks and uh, swordfish, swordfish um, that have become a, what they call Uri Hayline, which is they've converted from being a saltwater fish to a freshwater fish and they actually live permanently in the freshwater and I've seen bills from these sawfish that would be maybe a metre, metre and a half long, amazing creatures and they, they when they catch these fish and they, they keep the bills, they hang the bills up in the inside of the house, a bit of decoration. But because all of this area in the Ramu and the Sepik areas is fairly flat, you end up with these big, huge freshwater lakes, massive, and you can't, can't uh, grow much in there, you can't build houses, they won't grow timber or anything like that, but they do grow a lot of water lilies, which are very, very uh, nourishing, the, the bulbs of the water lilies are very nourishing, but they, um, they contain a, a, lot, a lot of uh, turtles, freshwater turtles, and any number of fish, and of course the crocodiles would be living in there as well. But um, to get into those lakes, you'd have to go from the main river along these little canals into the, the lakes of there. You can see the tree line there, that's basically the edge of the lake on, on that side. So the lake goes for miles the other way. And um, I was there on, a, on an election patrol, a by-election, we just happened to be in the village for Sunday, so we decided that we'd, we'd uh, go out and do a bit of hunting, shooting and fishing. And we came back with freshwater turtles, some ducks and a bunch of fish. But I'll just flip back to, to this particular, this image here. To give you an idea, the, the, the wooden canoes further up, not this metal one that's down the bottom, the wooden canoes up there it's going back to the, the problem that we have with, with creatures in the bush. After patrolling through these lakes, and I say that that lake would have only been maybe a metre deep, we would, st we would still wear our boots when we were walking on there. You wouldn't walk in there with, with bare feet. The locals would, not a problem, because the soles of their feet are, are like leather, so there's not a problem. But we would wear boots, and um, a colleague of mine um, was patrolling in that area and he, he got to uh, that little creek area that, to come out on a canoe and the canoe, as I say, the canoe would have been sitting in the water maybe a metre above water level and um, he was trying to get into the canoe so he, he stretched his left leg up he got his left leg over the edge of the canoe one of the porters behind him gave him a bit of a shove to give him a lift up he managed to get his right leg up to almost into the canoe when, because he had wet boots on, his, his heels slid in the bottom of the canoe and he ended up sitting in either side of the canoe and it was very, very sore, very painful. And having taken in a great big deep breath and said a few expletives, he fell into the canoe and he was recovering himself, trying to deep breathing exercises. And then he looked down at his leg and there was blood pouring down the inside of his thigh. And he thought to himself, 
Uh, I've been castrated by this, by this canoe. And he quickly dropped his shorts and had a look, and fortunately for him, it wasn't that. It was a very large bloated leech was in his groin, and when he went down on either side of the canoe, it popped, and all this blood ran down his leg. And he told me that from that day onwards, he always carried a condom with him when he went on patrol in this particular area, just to be safe. But smaller things had problems. We had problems with scrub typhus, and that, that is spread by, by uh, fleas and ticks, fleas in particular. And in this area, this gentleman here, by the way, has got no fingers and no toes. He's a, as a result of leprosy. Uh, he was uh, more than happy to, to show off his, his uh, ailment that he had, but he lived quite happily in the village. Nobody worried about it. But in this particular village, the patrol before would have been maybe four or five months before I'd gone and stepped, slept in that house. And um, I got covered with fleas, absolutely covered with fleas. It was, the house was full of chickens. And I said to the, the village leaders when I was in that house there, I said, that's it, I'm not staying in here. You've got to clear the chickens out, get rid of all the fleas, or if you don't do that, I'm going to burn it down. So I came back, say, about four months later, and sure enough, they hadn't done anything about it. So the house got burnt down and I moved on. So they were forced to build a, a new house. Um, that's the sort of rough justice that, that we administered there because there was no way that myself or anybody else was going to live in, live, in that, live in that particular house. But this is an idea. This is the MV Coro, which is the workboat. Somebody in this audience knows what that reminds them. <laughs> knows about that particular boat. And um, this is the boat that, that travelled up and down the coast of Madang with us. And when we had to go off onto the islands, we would go off on that one. Or if we were running a, a major court case uh, where a visiting Supreme Court judge or whatever would come down and they would live on that boat whilst the court case was taking place in the, in the village area. But this is an inland. This is the type of area that we used to, to patrol through on a very regular basis. Obviously, this bridge here is very, very temporary. You only needed, you know, a few centimetres of rain up in the hills and that would have been gone. So the next time a patrol came along, they just cut down a couple more trees and build another one. And the guy on the bridge there is carrying a very shiny stainless steel bucket, milking pail. How on earth I ended up with it, I've got no idea, but it was the the most luxurious piece of equipment I had when I was on patrol. But we would go on special patrols, and this is an, uh, an idea of, of a special patrol we went on. This map uh, was drawn um, with the aid of, a, of one of the local people who was flown down, well, he went down to um, Australia um, from Port Moresby during the war, and he gave them the, all the inside information on on a, a landing, American landing, in a place called Sidor. And um, they're the defensive lines, you can see. And the little red dotted lines you've got there, they're the retreat of the Japanese. But um, what the Americans did is they sent a patrol up to where the red X is, and they uh, established a defensive line up there. I was sitting in my office one day doing paperwork, because there was always paperwork to do, and this local councillor from that area came in with his string bag, and he brought the string bag in, and he was huffing and puffing and perspiring, and he went, bunk, and dropped this string bag on my desk, very heavy object on my desk. And I said, what have you brought me? And I pushed it open, and inside were two mortar bombs from World War II. And I said to him, in a language he could understand, please take those two mortar bombs away onto the other side of the airstrip. So he scurried off with that and I went in to see the boss and I said, look, he's come in with these mortars, what are we gonna do about it? And the reason he'd found them was that he was preparing a garden up in the hills. 
and um, they'd just come across these mortars. And he said, oh, there's plenty of them there. So my boss said, okay, off you go and find out how many mortars are. Well, it, it, to get from Sidor in this, this area here, there was a road built up to this point. It would take, I think it was taking about three and a half, four hours to drive along there. And then it was a, a day and a half to walk up into here. So it was almost two days to get from there to there. And um, I got up there and uh, went with the councillor where he found these mortar bombs. And sure enough, right along this ridge, there were six mortar positions. And there was light and heavy mortars alternating. And there were stacks of mortars, probably a metre, metre and a half deep hundreds of mortars that have been carted up into that area, never ever used and just left in piles. Not, they didn't take them away, they just, the, the Americans just left and left all that ordnance behind. So it took me two days to get from Sidor up to where that red cross is, and it took me about half a day to get back, because <laughs> I, I ran very, very quickly back to, to um, Sidor. And we called in the bomb disposal people from Port Moresby and they sent over a, a platoon and they went back up into there and uh, detonated the, all those, uh, that ordnance that was lying around. And we could actually hear all this stuff going off quite easily from side or a long way away. But all in this area where we were there, there was an, an awful lot of World War II uh, material lying around. I think this is a, a Betsy bomber. And um, being an aircraft engineer, I had a, an avid interest in looking at it to see if I could get it to fly again, but I don't think it would somehow. But that was, that was all the fun and games in that, that particular area. But this is a, a typical patrol image of a patrol. Now those poles that the uh, carriers are using to carry the patrol boxes they were actually used to make our beds. When we got to the village, um, they would take the poles, they would put, make an a, a X frame at two ends, and then they would push a pole, two poles into a bed sail made from sailcloth, put it in there, and then they would stretch that over the other poles and tie it down with bush rope. And that's, we, would, we would sleep on that until uh, it was time to move on. In one particular area, it was really, really cold, and I stuffed that bed sail with, with grass, and I would get that Coleman lamp at night, the uh, primer stove at night time, and I'd light it up and put it underneath the bed and let the heat go up and heat up all this straw that was inside the mattress. I'd switch the, the primer off, put it away, and then I'd jump into a nice warm bed. But um, when we got to the villages, we call them the villagers in and, and uh, we buy this guy with the white t-shirt um, as a policeman and we'd have to buy well vegetables for ourselves the police and any carriers that were staying in, uh, with us and moving on with us because th this particular village there would maybe be 150 people lived there and we were still using salt at that time to actually buy the provisions these people, the, the gentleman here in the blue shorts and the red belt and the blue top, he was a Lulawai, he was a village uh, leader. But that, their village comprised of one house, one huge house. And in that particular house, there's about 150, 200 people who lived in that house. They're amazing structures. They would be built around growing trees and um, down the center of the house, they would have two sleeping places and then a fire pit, two sleeping places, fire pit, and so on, right down the center of the house. And um, the ceiling of the house would be as high as the ceiling here in the theater. And um, uh, the, the families of the men that are sleeping next to the fire pits, there was a bamboo wall behind them and then the families would be between there and the, and the outside edge where the roof goes right down. That's where the family units, the, the wives and children, would be in there, and the men were in the, in the centre area. But uh, this just to give you an idea of, of patrolling. Um, the guy with the beard behind me is a member of a Spanish film crew 
who happened to be visiting and they decided to get some footage of us patrolling. But this, all this footage, the four images and the footage that you see was taken by me on a Super 8 uh, film camera and then transposed onto digital and it's all 1971 to 1977 uh, these images were taken. But you can see we're coming down to this fairly large river to cross and the carriers are coming out of the, the bush and they're actually walking across the river. The river's quite shallow at the, at the moment. It's, it was the dry season. So they prefer to carry the, the cargo across the, the river and come up the other side than to go across this, this rope bridge. You can see there's a rope bush material bridge there. So they would, they would rather go across at the bottom. You can see them entering the river down the bottom right hand side and then you'll see a couple of guys pop up there, they're coming up the other side. So that's them carrying all our gear. On this particular patrol, um, I'd taken our local government uh, council clerk with me and his job um, and this particular time was, was to collect the council fees and um, uh, this guy here was terrified the guy at the back was terrified about crossing the bridge and there's a couple of people behind him who were also terrified. But this is my council clerk and when he got to the end of the bridge getting ready to go off, these two guys coming along there, they were really shaking about going on this bridge. But my council clerk decided to give them a bit of a hurry up so he would just bone something down on there. And of course he's only, he's only moving it maybe a, a foot at that end but in the middle it was going about th two and a half, three foot. So that's, that's in the jungle proper, and now this, this is part of the 70-day uh, patrol. And this particular airstrip, you can see it's fairly flat on the right-hand side here. This is the steepest airstrip in Papua New Guinea. If, if any engineers here, that strip has got a, a gradient of about 15%, which is about the same gradient as the steepest street in, in New Zealand. And the plane would land on a very... 200 foot landing threshold and the pilot would have to accelerate up to the top of the hill and then he would have to stop very very quickly up the top here because as you could see there wasn't a lot of uh, stopping space. This was a, an assistant patrol officer that I had with me uh, training him on that particular patrol. But this was at 9,000 feet uh, up, in the, up in the mountains. But this will give you an idea of the type of terrain and that we're, I'm actually standing on a walking track looking down into this village and there was only one way into this village through, through the walking track. We went right around a big loop to come into the other side of the village and on the back end of the village you see all the foliage on the, the left hand side of the image. That was all uh, planted by the villagers and they would, they would plant uh, Bougainvillea, if you know what Bougainvillea is like, it's got all the spikes on it. Any Australians in the audience would know about the vine called Wait a While Vine, that's got all these hooks on it. So they plant all of that around the back there just to stop people actually getting into the village from, from the, uh, the bush on the left hand side. But as I say, I'm, I'm up on the, the top of a track looking down into that particular village. This is an even higher up village. We've got the village on this ridge in the centre, you can see through there. And as I say, it's not an aerial shot from an aeroplane, it's me on a walking track looking down to that village. Now it took two hours to get from where I was, taking this photograph, down to that particular village. And if you look on the centre there, there's a large building in the clearing on that left hand end there. Well this is the large building, it's a church. Now, it had taken me four days to walk from the coast into this village. You can imagine that they would have to carry all that sawn timber, all the corrugated iron, everything that was needed for that church they had to carry, all the nails, everything they needed, they had to carry from the coast up into uh, the hills there. And it, as I say, it took me four days and I wasn't carrying sheets of corrugated iron. So all these people had, had carried all this stuff up there to, to build this big church. So there it is again, there's the image. There, there's the church on the left-hand end there. 
No, we were at, stayed overnight in that village, and we said, okay, following day after we'd done all our work, it was a case of moving on to the next village. So we would yell out to the village right up on the top there. That's the next village up there. As I put the cattle on, we'll be there in six hours. So what we had to do is walk down this ravine, way down to the bottom, uh, sort of, there, there's the, this bridge. The bridge on the right is actually down there on the, the left there. That's the little bridge. It took two hours to walk down the ravine and four hours to walk up. And we came up the ravine and up this track, up the ridge there, up to here. So that was a day's work in getting from one village to the next. And um, we, would, we would obviously get there late afternoon, do the work, do some more work the following day, and then we would go off further into the mountain. So that gives you an idea of the terrain that we, we had to patrol in. This, again, is a, another image of that uh, string bridge that the people cross, and these are only up in the highlands because down on the lowlands are very, uh, there's no real need for these, this type of bridge. But when we first arrived in Papua New Guinea, we lived in a place called Bogia, and this is Manam Island. I, I pointed it out to you in my very first presentation. It's a volcanic island off the coast of uh, Papua New Guinea. And this is Manam, and you can see the smoke coming out of the top. And this image was taken in 1971. And it's 6,000 6, feet high. But this erup eruption took place in 1999. Um, and it's blown out probably a third of the top of the, of the volcano blew out and left this huge crater. And that's still smoking away today. But I was given the, the job as being the administrator for, for Manham Island when, when, uh, when we got up there. And uh, we used to go across from Bogia on a little government work boat. It was a ferro-cement work boat. And we'd go across and we'd land on these little uh, beaches, uh, jump off there. And uh, you, all you avid cruisers, you know what it's like getting on the tender, waiting for your tender ticket to go away. Well, that was, that was group one that went off in the tender. They came back to the ship. And I thought, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to bring modern technology into patrolling. I'm going to take with me my trusty Honda 90 motorbike. Now, that's not me, but that is the type of motorbike that we were issued. It was a Honda 90. Um, Australians would know those as the posties, posties motorbikes. So I decided I was going to take that motorbike with me, and I would do a one-week patrol in a day because I would be able to zip around the island very, very quickly on my trusty bike. So what do we do? We put it in the tender. So there's me and the motorbike and the boat's crew rowing away. Now, as soon as we passed the front of the work boat, out of the lee of the boat, this huge wave came in, whacked the dinghy. I lost my balance. I fell backwards into the water. And of course, what happened, the motorbike fell on my knees and the petrol tank for the motorbike is underneath the saddle and the petrol started falling out of there onto my face. I've got salt water, petrol, all the stuff that was in my pockets went away. Fortunately for me, this guy, the boat's crew, was a very strong young man. He pulled the motorbike up with one hand and got hold of my shirt with the other and dragged me into the dinghy. I hung on to the motorbike so I didn't fall over a second time and took me ashore. So after probably 20 minutes trying to get this motorbike started, I succeeded. I'm sopping wet on this motorbike. So I took off. I thought, oh, go, got to finish the job. Went right round the island, got to the other side of the island. I was greeted by this image. There's a 180 kilo groper there. And this particular, the guy at the back, the tall guy, he is the villager. And the bloke at the front, he's from the CPIC, and he was a school teacher. Now, 
on this island that's got a, a system, their, their system was like, um, a bit like medieval England where the king was all powerful and the king owned everything, all the land, all, everything that grew on it, the king owned everything, it was absolute. And in each of the villages there was a, like a baron and the baron would, would then control the villages. This guy, he was just a villager. But if any fishermen out there that they know a number seven hook, it's about maybe half an inch long, he'd gotten four of these number seven hooks and bound them all together. And then just on a piece of strong fishing wire, jumped in his canoe and he's paddling the canoe and all he's doing is pulling this hook on a line behind him. And what he did, he jagged the gill of that huge groper and pulled the gill open. So the, the groper didn't want to drown, so it came up to the surface and he found that he had this huge fish and it took him three hours to land it because he very gently paddled back to shore keeping the gill open so that the groper was at the surface breathing and as soon as he got within you know, a meter deep water the other villagers came out, whacked this groper on the head and they decided they had to take this into the village to give it to the chief because the chief would then distribute the fish but if you remember the shape of Banham Island, cone shape, and there we have the villagers tall, the Sepik guys short. They have to go into the village. The villager leads. So as soon as he started walking up to go into the village, this huge fish slid down the pole and this Sepik's head ended up inside the fish's mouth. And I've never seen any, I, I wish I'd taken a photograph then. I took that one and then I moved away and bang, he, there he's floundering around with this huge fish on the top of his head. But this is a sort of uh, very uniform village on the coast, very neat, very tidy. Um, great thing about this uh, situation in villages there that there's very little animal excreta around because um, the dogs eat the pigs and the pigs eat the dogs, so it keeps it nice and clean and tidy. But then we go off into the rivers again, and here's an election patrol. You would have seen this image of voting. But this is how we moved around on these huge canoes. And it's just a single log. It's not, it's not got outriggers or anything like that, no safety precautions, just a great big lump of wood that's been hollowed out. And there we've got this, it's 20 meters long, those things. And they certainly fly through the, the water when you're moving down the river. But then we end up with some patrolling in this sort of area. Very pretty. This is on in the Basavi area. Reasonably flat area. And uh, we're getting ready to, to move into a village. All the policemen have now put their boots on. The policemen generally don't wear boots when they're on patrol. Um, and uh, obviously the, the uh, local people haven't got any shoes anyway. But um, we wear boots all the time. And wore boots all the time when we're on patrol. But you had to be careful here because if there was a sudden downpour of rain upstream, you could quite easily end up going off the end of the, that waterfall there. But what I would do is, uh, on patrol, I'd take my trusty dog with me. And he was the bane of my life when it came to walking through the bush because he would disappear into the bush and come out um, chasing half a dozen pigs with him. Now, inevitably, the pigs belonged to somebody and inevitably he ended up with a, a little pig in his mouth. And inevitably the little pig had, was dead, so I had to pay compensation to the owner of the pig. So it cost me a small fortune, that, that nice friendly dog of mine. But um, this is what happened when we got to wherever we were going. We'd hang our boots up to dry and um, uh, get, getting ready for the next day's patrol. And just a quick uh, idea. This, this, these are stone axes that were still being used when we were there. When they cut down trees in Papua New Guinea, they cut them down at chest height. So that, that's not sawing it down at, at ground level, they cut them down at chest height. And this is all sized trees, from huge trees, huge logs, to just the, the sort of stuff they're going to use for firewood or whatever. So they use these axes to cut, cut the trees down. And um, this, is, this is my dog again. We were leaving the village and 
as we were leaving the village, the policemen were wearing their boots, and as we left the village, the policemen would take the boots off, because it's a lot easier for them to walk without the boots on. So we're walking away, we'd, we'd left the village maybe 20 minutes or so, and we're walking down the, the track, and the next thing we hear is squealing and grunting, and the dog had unearthed a wild pig further down the track. So he started chasing this pig towards us. Soon as the carriers and the police heard all this commotion, they dropped everything and went up the nearest tree. Me, I've got my boots on, and there's no way I can climb a tree with the boots on. The, the bark of the tree is inevitably damp and wet, so I'm standing there trying to get up a tree, and I can't get up the tree. And right next to me was a fairly decent-sized tree, it was maybe a metre, metre and a half, two metres in diameter, and I thought, I'll hide behind this tree uh, from this pig. Well, there's a dog chasing the pig. The pig saw me and started to come for me. So I ran around the other side of the tree, and the pig followed me. The dog followed the pig. And for about 35 seconds, the three of us were running around and around this tree. And eventually I was had enough breath to whistle on the dog, tell him to stop. I ran past the dog. The dog clamped his, his jaws on the back of the neck of this pig and held it fast. And as soon as the pig wasn't going anywhere, I took off down the track, running quite fast, and all the carriers and the policemen, they just fell out the trees like confetti, picked up all the gear, and they ran down the track. And I suppose we maybe got down the track, maybe 75 metres, 100 metres down the track, and I gave the dog a whistle. I whistled on the dog, and the dog just went <coughs> like that and broke this pig's neck. And he came down looking all very pleased with himself, and we went on to the next village. It was only a few hours away. Did all the work that we needed to do. And then we, we uh, stayed overnight there and then came back again. And when we got back to the village we'd just left, this was what was waiting for us. The villagers in the village we'd just left heard all the commotion and they came out of the village to find out what was going on. And they found this dead pig at the base of this big tree. So they had enough decency to hang on to it to the following day and, and they cooked it up for all the carriers and, and everybody else that was there and we, they all had a big feed. And but this, let's say, this, this dog of mine, he was the, uh, the bane of my life from time to time. <laughs> but going on these patrols in, in the bush, it was all, it was great fun. Uh, we achieved a lot and brought development to outlying areas and um, all, all, you know, we talked to people about various things and those areas where, the, where, where I said we sent the dog in first they tried to tell me there was crocodiles there and I said I don't believe you so I gave a couple of SG cartridges or shotgun cartridges with the, with the balls in them and I gave them to the village elder and I said you prove to me there's crocodiles here so we went away about four days later, we came back to that same village, and I'm sitting there, and I completely forgotten about this crocodile business. And he walked up to the patrol house that I was living in, and he just threw this crocodile skin down in front of me. And it was a 12 and a half foot long skin, and that didn't include the head. The head was gone, but the tail end was full of holes. And the, the people in this particular area, the most dangerous part of the crocodile is the tail. Not the mouth, they weren't interested in that. They could see that, but that tail, when it hit you and knocked you off your, your feet, then the, the other end came around and did the damage. So there's, this tail was just full of holes. So unfortunately, we weren't able to use that skin to uh, send off to um, the French handbag manufacturers. But it was always great to come home after being on patrol. This is my son. I don't know, he'd be six, seven months old there, I suppose. But it was always great to come back to the, to the, uh, to the family and, and take on my duties of changing nappies and things like that, and doing all the good things that dads did. Um, please join Morag uh, the day after tomorrow. She'll be making a presentation on living in isolation and in a tropical paradise. and. Um, she, she might, um, well, she will tell you things that I can't tell you about anyway. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much indeed for coming along.